Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 22nd, 2016, and my guest is Robert Frank, the Henrietta Johnson Lewis Professor of Management and Professor of Economics at Cornell's Johnson Graduate School of Management. He's the author of numerous books, and he's been a frequent guest on Econ Talk. His latest book is Success and Luck, which is the subject of today's episode. Bob, welcome back to Econ Talk. Hey, always good to be on with you, Russ. Now, Success and Luck is a short book, uh, which I view as a plus, not a minus. And in many ways, despite its length, it's, in a, it's sort of your magnum opus because it it combines a lot of themes that you've written about over the years and a lot of them we've talked about here. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. I want to start, if you can, with your story about a very lucky experience you had uh, on a tennis court. Yeah, well, one of the themes in the book, as you know from having just read it, is that uh, people tend to overlook the fact that they are often the beneficiaries of chance events or, or luck that plays out in various ways. Uh, I don't think I've been as vulnerable to that cognitive shortcoming just because I've been hit over the head so hard with various examples of luck in my own life. One of the ones I recount in the book is uh, an episode, oh, let's see, it was new, November, mid-November 2007. Tom Gilovich, my collaborator here at Cornell, uh, wonderful guy, psychologist I've known for three or four decades now. He and I were playing our usual Saturday morning tennis match. Uh, it was in the second set. I had won the first set. I was up 2-1 in the second, uh, he but tells me. <laughs> but who's counting exactly? <laughs> and and uh, during a changeover in the second set, uh, Tom later told me, uh, I complained to him of feeling nauseated. Uh, and then the next thing he knew, I was lying motionless on the court. I'd fallen off the bench. He He knelt to investigate. He discovered I wasn't breathing. I had no pulse. Uh, he called out for somebody to, to call 911 and then began working on me. Uh, he flipped me onto my back and started pounding on my chest the way we've all seen it done on TV and in movies, but hardly any of us, including Tom, had ever been trained to do. Uh, he told me later that after what seemed like a long, long time, he got a weak cough out of me. Uh, which was encouraging, but then uh, seconds later, I was out again, no no breath, no pulse. And he was beginning to give up hope when in through the door of the tennis center bursts uh, an EMT crew. The ambulance had arrived. They had uh, all their equipment. They ripped my shirt off. They put the paddles on me. They took me immediately to our local hospital there. They put me on a helicopter and flew me to a bigger hospital in Pennsylvania where they put me on ice overnight. Uh, and uh, I'm here. Uh, I had suffered, doctors later told me, an, an episode of sudden cardiac death. Uh, another term for it is sudden cardiac arrest. But you really are dead when it happens. Uh, the question is whether you'll stay dead. And in, in my case, I didn't stay dead. Uh, only because that second ambulance happened to arrive so quickly. And in Ithaca, where we were playing, it was about uh, six or seven miles out of town. The, the ambulances are dispatched from the far other side of town. How did this ambulance get there so quickly? Uh, the answer is pure dumb luck. Uh, by happenstance, two accidents, auto accidents, had occurred near the tennis center where we were playing. They had dispatched two ambulances to those sites. Uh, one of them, it turned out, didn't have any serious injuries, and that freed up the second ambulance to peel off and come just a few hundred yards to get to me. And except for that, I'm not here today. The the doctors told me 98% of the people who, who suffer sudden cardiac death in the field don't ever survive uh, and regain consciousness. Uh, they told me you don't want to see the few who do recover because they suffer from all sorts of infirmities, uh, too grim to mention. 
And for three or four days after the event, my family later tells me uh, I'm speaking nonstop gibberish from my hospital bed. But then on day four, I wake up with a clear head and uh, two weeks later, I'm playing tennis with Tom again. So, so yeah, luck has been a big feature in my own life. Uh, that's one of many dramatic stories that have, that have confronted me. But uh, the, the more general principle is that uh, luck happens in subtle ways. We're, we're often not aware of it. We don't take it into a, account very much when we construct our life narratives. And, and there are some negative consequences of our failure to appreciate the fact that when we do succeed, it's often because, in part, we were very fortunate. Well, I'm, I'm fortunate that you were... Um revive that day as well, as our, I hope our listeners uh, are. Uh, we've been the beneficiary of that uh, that luck or whatever it was. It's interesting. You, you mentioned that you're not a religious person. You didn't see it as, as the hand of God, but you do act as if it were the hand of God, right? You, you felt you had to do something uh, to convey the importance of that moment. Yeah, I, I have many religious friends. Uh, unlike many of my non-religious friends, I, I feel no contempt for them whatsoever. Uh, I, I Put think you in a small if, select group. Yeah. If you think of such things as examples of divine intervention, that's totally okay with me. Uh, my mother would have thought of it that way. I've, I've never been comfortable looking at things that way. I think it was just uh, a happy accident that I, I made it through. Without going into Tom Gilovich's um, theology, uh, it must have been a very powerful experience for him as well. Yeah, yeah. He, he said, uh, you know, when you hear the interviews with heroes at rescues, at accident scenes, they say, well, I just didn't even think I, I felt I needed to act in a certain way. And, and he tells that story, too. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm really grateful I was playing tennis with him and not any number of other people potential partners I can think of, you know, who would have panicked and wouldn't have thought clearly what, what's the best thing to do next. And your book in many ways is about the way we perceive ourselves. It's, a, it's as much a psychology book as it is a, a philosophy book or a public policy book. It's all three really. Um, it, you don't mention much about bad luck. Uh, so you're, the story you just told was a story of good luck. We have bad luck unfortunate things that happen to us. And I think we do notice those pretty much uh, and do use them often to, to explain things that didn't work out the way they did. Or do you have any thoughts on that? that oh, oh, for sure. Bad luck's part of the, the story too. And you're right. It's completely asymmetric in terms of our ability to recall examples of good and bad luck. Tom Gilovich has actually written about this. Uh, he talks about the distinction between headwinds and tailwinds. He uses that metaphor. Uh, so go do a Google search uh, on the term headwinds, and you'll see all sorts of vivid images pop up. Uh, people trying to keep their umbrellas from blowing them over in, in strong winds, uh, people on boat decks leaning at 45 degrees to keep from being blown overboard. Uh, the, the idea of headwinds is a very simple psychological concept, and, and when you're riding into a wind on a bike or you're running into a wind on a, a road race, uh, you just are very aware of the, the fact that you're working against a handicap. Uh, once the course turns around and you've got the wind at your back, oh, that's great. You know, you notice it, you feel it, but uh, pretty soon that slips completely from your consciousness. You're not really uh, aware in memory that you had a wind at your back or that you didn't have to overcome any obstacles, that things were going your way. So, yeah, I think it, it's a huge asymmetry. And when we, you know, when we suppose you've succeeded, uh, you ask yourself, well, why am I so successful? Uh, the obvious answer is that you're really smart and that you're hardworking uh, because almost all successful people are both of those things. They've been working their butts off for 30 years. They've been solving hard problems every day. Those are the things that are going to spring forth in memory when you try to think of why you got to where you got to. Uh, the, the tiny little episode where you had a mentor in the 11th grade that kept you out of trouble or uh, some little break at that where you got the promotion and a equally qualified co-worker didn't uh, those things don't stick in memory quite as much yeah and that's it's certainly true and and i one of the even though i don't agree with most of the policy proposals in your book 
as you, as you won't be surprised. Um, I do think the book forces you to think about uh, gratitude for things you have that you had no control over, uh, where you're born, who your parents are, some of those teachers. Of course, maybe we'll talk about it later. I've had plenty of bad teachers too. Um, that That's the, the, the unlucky side or whatever you want to call it. Um, but certainly – I think any person who honestly assesses their own success to the extent they're successful has to concede that there were parts of that success, perhaps even very large parts, that were not under their control, that were not their own doing. Uh, yes, as you point out, there's often a lot of hard work to go with that. And the, but the, and those are the things I think we tend to think of. Those are the things we're proud of. We don't like the idea that um, – they were successful, say, because we're tall or good looking or born in the United States or whatever it is. Uh, and I think that's absolutely psychologically, I think that's true. And we're going to talk about why why that is. Uh, but let, let's start with the, the point that just psychologically, what, what are the imports? What's the import of this, this asymmetry with respect to luck versus our own ability? You know, I think it's good that people take pride in the fact that they're uh, talented, that they that they've worked really hard. It's it's not easy to work hard. I mean, that's that's almost implicit in the term. Hard work is is hard, and you got to get out of bed in the morning when you might not feel like it. You got to tackle a, not just the tasks you really like to do, but lots of unpleasant ones as well. So, you know, feeling proud of yourself for the fact that you worked hard, that's a good thing because pride's a motivator. It helps get, get you out there to confront the obstacles that if you don't confront them, you're not going to succeed. So, uh, yeah, it, this is not a human pathology that I think we tend to remember why we succeeded in the ways that we do. Uh, but there are some negative consequences to it. Uh, I think people do not... Uh, spontaneously tend to remember the lucky breaks they enjoyed along the way. What's interesting, though, is that if you prompt them to think about that, you know, I've, I've given talks in bright red political districts. Cornell sends me out to talk to alumni. And and it's amazing how the, the, the flint-eyed entrepreneur will come up and, and start telling me stories after the talk of some break he enjoyed, that, except for which he'd be dead. I've, I've got a a, a very uh, hardline college classmate, close friend, who's been a very successful entrepreneur. He's nearing retirement now, and he's fought government government regulators his entire career. He's angry at them. Uh, you know, he he's been sending me notes about uh, oh, he got struck by lightning once on a golf course. There was somebody who knew what to do on the scene, or else he wouldn't be here. He got hit by a a car when he was three growing up in Alabama and by chance uh, the impact caused his arms to wrap around the upright uh, member that were on the car bumpers back in the 40s and so he was dragged along without being thrown under the wheels for two or three blocks until uh, people on the side of the street could get the motorist's attention and get him to stop and and now he's talking to me about public investments in infrastructure and education that he could support so I think Reminding people to think about the fact that they might have had a break along the way, that's, that's a very useful step for them. And, and as you say, uh, it's, it doesn't seem to, to make them unhappy in any way. Not only that, it make, makes them uh, feel a greater sense of well-being. There's a huge literature on gratitude now that, that shows that it, it completely defies our economist's concept of scarcity. You know, we... <laughs> We, we say the more more you want of something, the more you have to give up of everything else. Uh, yes, in general, maybe, but in the realm of human emotion, that's not always true. And if you experience gratitude, uh, you don't give anything up from doing that. Uh, it makes you happier. It makes you healthier. There are all sorts of uh, kind of miracle side effects of experiencing the emotion. And everybody ought to look for ways to get more in touch with it. But the insight that I really like that you haven't mentioned yet is this idea that you can, as you mentioned before, that certainly people who are successful look at their own hard work. They look at their own um, efforts and they forget about the fact, the part you haven't mentioned is they forget about the fact that there are a lot of other people who worked hard 
and smart and who are skilled and they don't succeed. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's the the clear fact on the table. If you would only look uh, carefully at it, you'd see it without any difficulty. Being smart and hardworking. I, you don't want to say that they're sufficient for success uh, by any means. There's so many smart, hardworking people who don't succeed. They're not even necessary for success, although most successful people have those qualities. You know, but you can look at lip syncing boy bands, you know, some of these derivatives traders. You know, there, there were a lot of people who got spectacularly successful without being really particularly talented or hardworking. But that's the exception. I thought about oh. I thought about Tom Brady, who was drafted very low in the NFL draft when he came into the National Football League and is famous for working hard. And I'm sure if you asked him about his success, or whether he was would tell you or not, but I, I suspect he's proud of his work effort, and he should be. Uh, it's obvious that he's very devoted to his craft, but he was fortunate uh, in many ways to right. come into the t- a team that had uh, a very – uh, intelligent coach, a very successful coach who saw his promise, put him into a game and kept him in the starting role, which many coaches wouldn't have. Uh, he's on a team with a great deal of stability because of its owner. And it's uh, it's a great team. Partly it's a great team because of him, but it's partly a great team that he's been lucky to be associated with. And we certainly know many great quarterbacks who weren't successful and many great quarterbacks who didn't even make it, even though they worked probably very, very hard. And that part's hard, I think, for us to accept as as successful people. We like to think it's both necessary and sufficient, and it may not be. I just want to mention uh, Walter Oy. Did you know Walter? I did. So Walter's a labor economist, a very creative economist. I was his colleague at the University of Rochester, and Walter lost his eyesight at a very uh, young age, I think in the middle of graduate school. And uh, um, he he told me the following story when I was his colleague. He said they had a fellow student who said, Walter, you know, you've got a handicap. You're blind uh, and uh, you managed to overcome it, which is amazing. He said, I have a handicap, too. I'm lazy and I can't seem to overcome it. So it's an interesting. Yeah. We think often of our hard work as our own doing. But part of our hard work, our ethos is and our ability to focus and concentrate and make sacrifices. Some of that's genetic and some of it's nurture. And how much of it is our own self-will is very hard to know. Yeah, I I think that's such an interesting issue. Uh, It it clearly is genetic. You know, some people are born uh, with no impulse to get going in the morning. Uh, They just don't have that. Uh, other people have it in spades. I, I, I like to think uh, that I might have won some prizes if I had the industry that my wife was born with. Mm-hmm. You know, she gets up in the morning and she's just a dervish uh, attacking her task. I'm, I'm much lazier than she is. But I, I think it's important uh, that you not think of it that way. I mean, there are parallels to the classical discussions on free will Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Your book made so, me think about that. So, yeah, you, you want to think that uh, it's your responsibility to work hard. Don't go bitching about having been born without an inclination to work hard. Uh, how hard you work is partly up to how much determination you summon to work hard. And if you think that's all predetermined, you're going to say, well, uh, I'm a cork in the river. Might as well sit back and watch what unfolds. That's not the best way to attack your life. You know, you want to assume that you're the captain of your fate. Uh, you're not yeah. the captain of your, of your fate, but uh, it's a, a much more adaptive posture to assume that you are and, and attack it that way. Makes the movie better too. You know, my movie of my <laughs> exactly. life, uh, I like to think I'm scripting it. Of course, I'm not. Um, to some extent, I, you know, it's it's a deep, deep philosophical question, as you say, as to how much of that is true. And I, we're not going to settle that. And we're not even going to talk about it anymore, probably. But uh, I do want to mention Branch Rickey. Uh, I think I have this right. I think it's Branch Rickey who said luck is the residue of design. And he certainly uh, – that that claim is a dis- disagrees with yours. I'm not even sure I understand the claim. Why well, don't I you think he means tell me he, what you think I, he meant? I think he means you he, you plan. He's a baseball. Um, yeah, I know who he is. I'm just telling the audience. I didn't oh. mean to say, <laughs> Bob. I didn't mean to say you didn't know who he is. You, you know Walter Roy. You know Branch Rickey, of course. Uh, Branch Rickey is a, uh, an important figure in sports who uh, 
brought Jackie Robinson, the first African-American, into the game of the white side of baseball, Major League Baseball. Uh, when he said luck is the residue of design, I think he was saying that hard work and practice is uh, what comes first. And then what's left over? Yeah, there's some – there's a little bit of my outcome that's a, that's you know, that's a random variable perhaps. But it's really just the uh, – it, it's just a small piece. It's the residue. It's just a little – it's what's left over, it, and it looks, I think, relatively so. That's what. That's why I've always interpreted it. Maybe I'm not interpreting it correctly. Well, small or large. What about the people who work hard and are talented who who fail? Uh, and yeah, Branch wasn't thinking of them. In in the market that we have going forward, uh, it's going to be more and more uh, one with that structure. There's going to be. Uh, uh, a task to be done. Technology will enable the person who's best at doing that task to serve almost the entire market for it. And then there's a huge shootout to see who the best person is at doing that task. And and the talent uh, distribution is very dense. The, the winner uh, will almost invariably not be the most talented person in the contestant pool. Because the the talent ceiling gets all bunched up, there are lots of talent uh, contestants who are near the maximum amount of talent a person c could have, and among those, the the person who has the most talent uh, won't be any luckier or less lucky than the average contestant in the whole whole enterprise. And among the other nearly talented as talented people, there'll be some who were incredibly lucky. And even if luck counts for one percent or half of one percent, that's all it takes to make the lucky guy the winner and the unlucky guy the loser. So that that metaphor is. Uh one you're associated with, you've worked on, written on, uh, and, and I maybe even coined the phrase with Philip Cook, the winner-take-all economy. You know, Sherwin Rosen uh, and uh, Ed Lazier also worked on that question, uh, along with many others, of course. Um, and the way I think of it, and tell me if this is a fair summary, and I, I think it's uh, was useful for me in trying to think about your ideas. So there, in our economy today, being the best has a bigger kick for a bunch of reasons than it had before. And as a result, it's a bigger prize. And that encourages lots and lots of people to enter what is effectively a lottery. A lottery in the sense that it's not purely random. You have to have a certain minimum level of talent and maybe a very high level to compete for the top prizes as, say, the best golfer or the best entrepreneur in this area or the best singer, uh, the best actor, actress, or one of the best. But the prizes are so large that more and more people enter the lottery. But, of course, being the 15th best tenor or the 15th best tennis player doesn't pay nearly as well as being the best. And uh, to enter the lottery, you have to work hard and have a lot of talent. But that's not sufficient. You probably won't win. Only one or a few can win. And the rest are just um, relegated to a much lower status and much lower income. Is that a fair right. summary? Yeah, no, that's a very artful summary. So that's the reality of our modern economy to some extent. I, I, I don't think it's as ubiquitous perhaps as you do. Um, but I want to talk about the downsides of that, which you talk about in the book. So one of them comes from uh, Nicholas Kristof, uh, that people are oblivious. Not only do they overestimate their own skill, but they're, they're much less uh, sympathetic to people who don't succeed because they presume – that they have not tried hard enough or have uh, – are just not skilled enough, and that's not necessarily true. So talk about what the consequences of that are. You know, I think going forward, one of the challenges is going to be uh, how does everybody manage to, to live what society regards as a, a suitable existence? If if the GDP goes more and more pu purely for meritocratic reasons uh, to people at the top of the, the income distribution and less and less everywhere else, then I think the conditions of life gradually get more difficult for people further down in the queue. And it's not a, a matter of, of us not being able to provide medical care for people who need it of not being able to provide quality schooling for everybody. We have the resources to do that. These technologies create enormous amounts 
of new wealth. It's going to be a question of whether we're willing to uh, support the the tax payments needed to fund activities like that. And I think the the barrier that we've been facing is that uh, if you if you have the illusion that you succeeded entirely on your own, you were talented and hardworking, full stop, rather than if you see yourself as talented, hardworking, and fortunate, then there, there's clear evidence that you become stubbornly determined to hold on to every possible nickel that comes your way in the marketplace. And that's made it uh, increasingly difficult for us to repair basic infrastructure, you know, to, to fund access to schooling. You know, when, when I graduated from college, I, I got a degree from a, an excellent state uh, supported institution, Georgia Tech. Uh, I came from a family without much money. I had zero debt when I graduated. Uh, that's not possible for anybody today. You know, the kids are graduating now. The kids with debt have an average of thirty-two thousand dollars in debt when they get out of a four-year school. And the the music programs in the school are getting can schools are getting canceled. Uh, you can you can have them in after-school uh, special sessions if you pay a fee. That that excludes the low-income kids too. Athletic programs they're getting closed down. Uh, you can pay a fee and get coaching. So I think uh, if we're if we're willing to share some of the largesse that comes our way if we're talented, hardworking, and lucky, then we'll have a, a much better society to live in. That's, that's the basic uh, picture that's supported by all the evidence that I've seen. Yeah, of course, I've seen some other evidence. Um, yeah, let's get into that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, but I, you know, I don't – some of it's evidence. I guess you know, there are two things I would say to that. Uh, some, and we've talked about this before, and I, I could keep talking about it because I find it utterly fascinating, and I hope listeners enjoy hearing about it. Um, the, the problem for me is that you paint a sad picture of America's infrastructure, public education, you know, charging for athletic programs, music, and um, I, some of that. I don't know whether it's good or bad to charge for things. Sometimes I, a lot of a lot of me says it's that's not the worst thing in the world. But the point I want to make here is that budgets are bigger. Uh, it's not like we've had these draconian cutbacks in the size of government at the federal level. I don't think it's true at the, even at the state and local level. Um, so I'll tell you a story to capture my uh, pessimistic view of, of this. You painted a very nice picture. I like it. Uh, so here's my pessimistic story. My son uh, on spring break decides to go to South Carolina, uh, and he borrows our, our family car in a gesture of, of goodwill on part of his parents. And uh, two weeks go by, and yesterday I received a letter from the Washington Police Department that that my car – I thought it was me at first, but I realized it wasn't. It was my son. But my car uh, had been seen speeding on uh, 295, uh, and as a result, uh, the owner of the car, me, owes uh, – which will be my son <laughs> – owes, uh, in fact, owes $100 uh, for that speeding violation. So I thought, boy, that's depressing. That's going to bother him. Then uh, I opened up the second piece of mail from the same source. I thought maybe just be enough, something about how to pay it. or No, it was a second fine, five minutes apart from the first one. Um, uh, he had violated another uh, uh, camera, and as a result, he owed an additional 200 So he had $300. Uh, when I told him, uh, the first thing he did is he got online and he found that that the camera with the $200 fine was the number one revenue source from speeding cameras in at least probably the D.C. area, maybe just D.C. I think he said there had been um, – it had raised millions of dollars, which now his two or $300 contrib $200 contribution from that camera and 100 from another would be joining it this year. Uh, the numbers he had seen were from um, 2012. And so tell me this. When I talk to him about it the next time, should I say, yes, it's depressing – uh, it's true that $300 is, an, is a very large sum of money for you, and it certainly changes the cost-benefit calculus of the vacation you had. And I'm, pr I'm pleased to say that he doesn't want to charge his fellow riders. Though if any of them are listening, they can certainly <laughs> – they're welcome to help him out. But I don't think they're, they owe it to him unless they egged him on. And I, I see, a, by the way, a photograph of the road. It's a six-lane divided highway. It looks like it should, the speed limit should be 55 or 65. It's actually 50 
Uh, and he was caught going 62 at one point and 71 in the other, which puts him in very good company because with the tens of thousands of other people who've been caught by those cameras. So should I tell him, oh, don't feel bad. Washington, D.C. Is, is really falling apart, which is, I think, somewhat true. This is where you and I agree. It's really uh, – it's sad how many things could need could be improved by Washington, D.C. Take solace from the fact that your $300 will be well spent toward a good cause. Can I say that with him straight face? You know, I don't like speed traps either. Uh, I'm the, putting that to the side, Bob. I'm asking the, you, does the, the – question does the, is – Where is the money going? Uh Washington, D.C. does need money. I don't think that's the best way to raise it. Uh, but can can he pick himself up, dust himself off, and move on with equanimity? Sure he can. No, but can he do it knowing that his $300 is going to be making the world a better place? That's what uh, I'm really asking. Let's hope that it does make the world a better place. What are the uh, odds? What are the odds? Well, look, come on. I would say they're small. The, the government budgets are pretty big. Uh, every year we read uh, stories, well-documented ones, of fraud and abuse. Uh, but as a fraction of the total, those numbers are very, very small. Uh, there are bridges to nowhere. Republicans vote for them. Democrats vote for them. Uh, you got to be vigilant to get rid of projects that shouldn't be built. Absolutely. Uh, but when you look at the government budget as a whole, basically uh, the the percentage that's accounted for by fraud and abuse is, is minuscule. Uh, by and large, we under provide basic goods and services uh, for, for the in the public sphere in this country compared to almost every other developed country. One of the examples I use in the book, uh, and I, it's a very effective one for me, is the, the odd situation where you have people at the top of the income ladder spending two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 extra to get a slightly higher performance car and then driving it on roads that are riddled everywhere with footy potholes, so a Ferrari, F7 Berlinetta V12 engine. It's it's a great car, three hundred thirty-three thousand uh, dollars. Because we underfund the public sphere, we have uh, that car driven on terrible, jouncy roads that, that damage the suspensions and brakes and other other automotive equipment to the tune of something like three hundred dollars per vehicle per year on average. So we have that. Uh, you could buy instead a Porsche 911 Turbo. That's a that's a terrific car. If if you've never driven one, uh, it's it's very nearly the equal of the Ferrari. It costs less than half as much, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And if you spent that much less on the high end car, you'd have more than enough money to have the roads be mirror smooth. So who's happier? Somebody who's driving a Porsche on mirror smooth roadways or somebody who's driving a Ferrari on roads riddled with foot deep potholes? That's an easy question. It is. I agree with you on that, uh, more or less. Um, I just don't think – I think that hides what's really the source of the problem, which is that I don't think that – and by, by the way, I think the roads are – the roads, at least where I live, I live in Montgomery County, uh, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. The roads are in actually pretty good shape. They're repairing them constantly with my dollars. Uh, I'm always wondering whether they're over repairing them uh, because it <laughs> you, enriches. If you live near me, you wouldn't be asking yourself well, the question. It's interesting. Like you live in a colder climate, right? Yeah. Potholes are a bigger problem. Yeah, it's a harder problem. I agree. Um, so it's probably a bigger problem there. But I would, I would also argue that Washington D.C. I would guess has more potholes than than Montgomery County per square mile. Perhaps let's say that's true. Would that would you argue that that's because Washington, D.C., quote, doesn't have enough money in its budget? And there I think the answer is no. The problem is not that they don't have enough money. The problem is that they spend it poorly. And that process takes away my incentive to be as giving with my money as you would like me to be through the tax system. I don't – I don't. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a classical liberal. I'm a very small government person. I'm not an anarchist. I'm a small government libertarian or a classical liberal. And I'm happy to pay some taxes. I understand that you get things that are valuable. But most of my tax money doesn't go to the things that you and I would agree on, which are – it's a long list or at least wouldn't be angry about. 
it's the stuff that's in the list that we would be angry about that takes away my political impulse to support your 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 solutions. You know, look, I'm not going to argue with you that we have uh, always responsive and efficient government. That's clearly not the case. Uh, I will note, though, Russ, that if you travel to many other countries on the planet, I've just come back from two weeks in New Zealand, uh, you see a dramatic difference in the public spheres in other countries uh, from what we see here. And I think if you if you take surveys of citizens, which a group called Transparency International does do every year, and ask people, how do you feel about your government? Are the officials corrupt? Do you feel you get good value for your tax contributions? Uh, the the citizens of New Zealand, of Canada, of the Nordic countries, there are about 10 countries that year after year are at the top of that list. They, they've worked hard. They've built responsive governments. You don't get a responsive government for nothing. Uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an institution that has to be built and nurtured. Uh, and they've done that, and they've been reaping enormous benefits from it. Uh, we, uh, in contrast, have been bashing the government, saying government's not the solution, it's the problem. And so smart people, maybe they don't think government service is an honorable thing even to get involved in. Uh, you, you've got to accept, as you obviously do, that there are legitimate things for government to be doing, and then say, let's try to do them right and, and, and work on the institutions. Well, I have no doubt that there are cultural differences, along with many, many other factors that could make uh, differences in both how our governments perform relative – our government in America performs relative to other countries as well as how we perceive it, which is not the same thing. Uh, but you know, your particular two weeks in New Zealand gave you some taste of New Zealand's public services. It may be a more complicated picture. The question then is how do we get there from here? I, I think – you know, I, you quote um, Elizabeth Warren's famous uh, – a uh, speech that, quote, there's nobody in this country who got richer on their own. And then she talks about the infrastructure that helps people be successful, our roads, our schools that trained us, uh, the the uh, the police and firefighters kept the factory safe of that entrepreneur. And yet the problem I have with that is that if that's what governments did, except for the education, I'll put that to the side. But if government stuck to what it does well, roads, police, fire, the courts, most of which, should, by the way, should be provided at the local level, not to me, not the federal level, and are provided at the local level, then, well, that would be okay. I'd be okay. I would, we would like government. The problem is when government does things it shouldn't be doing, of which there's a, a much longer list. And I would even include things – and here's – I appreciate your challenge of my government bashing as contributing maybe to the source of the problem – but I would say the people on the more interventionist side who say support Social Security for everybody rather than just for poor people, uh, do you think that hinders the fact that we insist on taxing everybody and giving everybody back some money when they get older? Do you think that hinders our budgetary ability to do things that are that are more important? Of course it does. So you would you would you're in favor of means testing Social Security? The the. Which original formula was set up because uh, Roosevelt felt that was the only way to get political buy-in for the system. If if people felt that it was not a welfare program, that it was a program that everybody had a stake in, you contribute, you get money back. Uh, I think uh, that if we had the political messaging strength to persuade people that, no, that's that's uh, a, a necessary step when you're trying to launch a program, maybe to, to think of it that way, but that now it would be much better to, to view it as uh, a support program for people who are especially in need, uh, or better still, to have a savings program that everybody participates in. Uh, that That's the only real way that people are going to retire with enough money to to sustain themselves at a comfortable standard, uh, that would be much better. Okay. Well, I'm glad we agree on that. Uh, I, I prefer none at all, but uh, if we're going to have one, I, I think the right way to have it is to certainly have it help the people who are the poorest and not give uh, – and there is a slight redistributional element in uh, Social Security if you live long enough to get it. Uh, so that you know, we should mention that. Um, well, if you just rely on voluntary savings, that sounds terrific. But first of all, people aren't very good at 
anticipating the future and dealing with it. Uh, so, so set that problem to one side, even if they had perfect foresight and no self-control problems, still there's the collective action problem. You know, if I've got some savings, what do I do with it? Well, I could nurture it and, and live comfortably in retirement when the time comes, or I could do as my neighbors have done, which is to take the money out of those accounts and use it to bid for a house in a better school district. And if they do that and I don't do that, then my kid goes to the school with a metal detector out front. So I'm going to spend those savings as, as sure as I'm breathing uh, rather than see that happen. Well, the only to- way you can get that money protected for retirement is say, well, it's just off limits until then. Uh, I think there are a lot of other aspects to the problem and solutions to the problem. I think there are there are voluntary um cooperative charitable help we could give to the elderly as we used to when social security didn't exist or when it was smaller at the state and local levels for old people um but i want to segue to this uh issue which i know is dear to your heart which is the progressive consumption tax we'll talk about that in a second and that's another area we more or less agree on by the way which is always pleasant um but i want to stop in the middle here and talk about parenting uh what do you think i should teach my children about these issues, about luck and success, and uh, what are the implications for for parenting? You know, that's a, an issue I take up indirectly in the book. Uh, it, it, there's some paradox here, obviously. Uh, Duncan Watts said the 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 thing that you need to do is envision yourself as the captain of your fate. That's the only way to construct a successful life. Uh, but to construct a successful society, you need to recognize that people are not, in fact, in the end, the captains of their fate, that there's a whole lot more to the story than that. And so I think I would I would stress to my kids, as I did do, that uh, you don't wait for somebody else to to do it for you. It's up to you to make make yourself break out from whatever pack you're trying to compete with. Uh, it, it's not luck. It's it's your effort and talent that are going to settle who wins and who loses. So, yeah, I think that's the attitude you need to bring to those fights. Uh, but you should also try as best you can to inculcate in them a sense that if things turn out badly for people, it's not necessarily because they're evil. Uh, you know, most of the bankruptcies that we see in the U.S. are because of medical catastrophes, people who get some serious illness and the and the bills mount up into the hundreds of, of thousands of dollars or more and, and they file for bankruptcy. Uh, that's not being a bad person. That's that's just bad luck. Uh, for a minute there, I thought you were going to get into presidential politics. We'll put that to the side here in March of 2016 when you mentioned bankruptcy. Um, let's talk about an aspect I don't think you talk much about in the book, which I would call the elasticity of desire or the elasticity of grit or the elasticity of labor. So for me, when I think about these issues, philosophically, the question is how much room is there for self control, self discipline, self application. Um, you know, thinking about my own children, I I would want them to work hard. So uh, I, I wouldn't deceive them. I, I don't. I, I do think it's important to be honest in, in terms of the the risks of and the, the the possibility that good work and hard work's not re- always rewarded. It isn't, and life isn't always fair. And I think you should tell your kids that. But I think when we think about the bigger picture and get into some of these issues, and you refer, you talk about not just bankruptcy, but criminals, people who have you know, grow up in a bad part of town, they're more likely to to be put in jail uh, just from it seems where they were born. Right. The question would be, how much would it be different if if we didn't um, incarcerate people? Would it? Would it change things? Would more people be criminals? Would more people try to avoid uh, jail if we were harsher, et cetera? And similarly with taxation, what's how much do people respond to these taxes versus just they're going to work hard anyway? I think those are the key questions we don't yeah. have a lot of and, information. And on. there's exciting research on that coming out. Uh, what we know in the in the That's crime, exciting, Bob. I suspect it supports your position, but go ahead. <laughs> in the crime domain, for example. Uh, what we know now with much greater certainty than than we knew 30 years ago is that it's the it's the probability of 
a sanction, not the severity of it that really governs the choice about whether to break a rule. And so uh, the the draconian sentences, the harsh punishments, those aren't the deterrent. It's it's knowing that if you do wrong, you're likely to pay a price for doing wrong. Mark Kleiman's got a, a, a great book out, When Brute Force Fails. It's just all about this idea of uh, smart policing. Uh, you can't watch every potential criminal, so you focus on the most likely people to commit crimes. And you tell them, we're watching you 24-7. The moment you step out of line, you're going to get hammered. Uh, so that gang, uh, just not because they want to go straight, but because they know it's going to be too costly not to, they, they start cleaning up their behavior. That frees up the police to focus on the second worst gang. And so their behavior cleans up and they work their way down the list. There's so much more we can do now with criminal sanctions uh, applied smart than the old brute force way. Uh, The economists always used to think it was the expected value of the punishment, the severity times the probability that mattered. It's really not that at all. Yeah, I'm sympathetic to that, uh, actually. Uh, I agree. I'd like to think that's true, and uh, we've talked on here before about how I think emotionally we have trouble with the idea of a small probability of of being caught with a very high punishment, even though it might have the same expected value. If there's something disturbing about 99 people getting away with a small crime and one right. person being uh, executed for it, it seems uh, unjust. It is unjust in my opinion, but, but what about labor supply? Uh, do you think we understand much about how people respond to higher tax rates? I, I think we're beginning to get a pretty clear picture there, too. Uh, California just raised its top marginal income tax rate substantially. This was after years of uh, budget disaster, the 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 prize jewel of the nation's public education system, the UC uh, university campuses, were just being sold down the river to, to make up for budget shortfalls in the state. They, they raised the top tax rate. Uh, the predictions were dire. Everybody's going to move to Oregon or Washington or Nevada. Uh, hardly anybody moved. Here's the thing. Uh, if, if you're rich uh, and the tax rate on you goes up, what what's the effect of that? Well, now you have less money to spend on the things you want than before. Uh, normally, when that happens, that's a bad thing. So if you have a house fire or a divorce or your business has a bad year, you have less money. You're less able to bid for a house with a view or choice slip at the marina, whatever it might be. It's very different when you and other people like you have less money. I, I think this is the the... My, my one big idea in life, somebody asked me, what's your big idea? And I had to think, you know, do I even have one? Yeah, it's- uh, and, and, and if I have one, it's this. It's that when, when you're rich and you and others like you have less money, there's almost no consequence of that. You can put extra dollars into the public uh, sphere, make better roads, better schools, and you and others like you will have less money. That means the penthouse apartment with a view of Central Park is going to fetch a lower price at auction than before, but it's going to end up in exactly the same hands as before. So, yeah, so the allocative. It, it's there. just a cognitive error to think that taxes are going to hurt as much as you think they will. That's because you translate higher taxes as meaning I'll have less money. And most of the time when you have less money, that does hurt. But it doesn't hurt when you have less money and others like you also have less money. Well, it's a very clever idea. I don't know if it's your best idea, Bob, but I, I concede its cleverness. And it is in the running. I can, and I see why. The problem I have with it, of course, is that while that's true about the slip at this marina nearby or even a lot of marinas nearby – or the particular a set of particular style of housing or houses with a view, as you as you say, your point is that well, there's a limited number of houses with a view, and therefore it's a to put it in economic jargon, it's inelastically supplied, perhaps close to vertically supplied, and so there's very little allocative inefficiency for uh, lowering the amount people bid on it. The same people are going to get it as got it before. That's just that's the everyday way of saying what I just said. Right. And I agree with you. I think that's true for certain kinds of goods. And those goods are the goods that 
rich people and other human beings use perhaps to compete in non-monetary ways for prestige and respect and status. Um, Don't and, even think of it in those terms. Think of it as you want something special. And special is just inherently a relative concept. You know, I want something that excites me. It stands out from what I'm used to. Uh, and, and, that, and you get the same set of results if that's the motive. And I think everybody wants something special. I think they might, but there's there's a lot of things that are special in my life that aren't that I don't keep from anybody else because they're supplied very easily at, at relatively low prices and low costs for additional items. And they uh, don't seem special for long. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, it depends what you mean by special, I guess. I mean, I have on – right now I'm wearing a very uh, expensive shirt, and I'm thrilled that I have the income to, to uh, afford it. No one sees it, almost no one. I work at home. <laughs> no one gets to admire it. You listeners, you can't imagine how beautiful it is, but my wife loves it, and I like it too, and it's a pleasant thing. I didn't spend you know, $100 for it, but it's a relatively expensive shirt, and I'm happy that I have the, 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 the ability to, to, buy, to splurge on this shirt. It's nice. No, but the point is you like it because it stands out in some meaningful way from what you consider to be the norm for shirts. Yeah, but I'm not lording it over anybody else. No, 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 that's the point. This isn't about lording it over other people. You know, when the the average American Explain. wedding now costs $31,000, it's not costing that much, uh, three times as much as in 1980 because people want to lord their fancy wedding over everyone else. It's just because the standards that define special now have escalated to that point. Yeah, well, and I think that's just because we're really wealthy, and, and I don't see that in the way you see it. It's just a mindless or wasteful competition. I just think it's really nice to have an even grander wedding, although that happens to be something I don't expect to splurge on. I don't, and I don't I'm, – I'm, let me give you a simpler example. I drive a car that is much more mundane than the car I could afford. Now, why? Well, I don't have to have a fancy car. There are many of my friends who drive fancier cars than I do and, and, and that are literally fancy cars. They're, they're ex, quote, expensive cars. I, I find my specialness somewhere else. I don't know why you think – that the virtues of a higher lifestyle mean necessarily that it's all wasted in an arms race to, to match everyone else. I just, I don't. Just they don't all mean that. But what we do know is that average couples are spending $31,000 now and that that hasn't made anybody any happier than when they were spending $10,000. In fact, there's a new paper out. You'll you'll enjoy this. People who spend more than twenty thousand on their wedding are twelve percent more likely to divorce <laughs> per year than people who spend between five and ten thousand on their wedding. Yeah, there's so many reasons I'm not going to like that. And this conversation is only the smallest of those. But <laughs> the other, you know, the selection bias problem is my bigger yeah, problem with it. Maybe it's not a causal yeah, effect. Exactly. Maybe but, not. But so let me try to restate what I'm trying to say, and then I want to move on. If if you don't have anything to say in response, that's too too uh, uh, logic demanding for my – attacking of my argument. I was trying to say that I understand your point about boat slips and you know the highest penthouse view and the 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 uh, the beach house. The, those those are they're, those are things that are very limited in number. There are many many special things in life, wonderful things in life, glorious things in life. That aren't limited. And so more and more people having them is a good thing. It's not some wasteful competition that we won't – that we can get rid of and, it, and it's not going to make, make any difference. I, I don't think it's all about relative status. That's all. It's a question well, of the, how much. The, the progressive consumption tax, which you say you like, really hammers people with high rates uh, and that's really the wrong – way to frame it. Uh, I, I would say a rich guy would want to be hammered with high rates on consumption levels beyond a few million a year because those kinds of consumption are almost purely positional whether there's any inherent physical limit or not. There, there's no limit what you can spend on a wedding. You know, you can hire the Beatles uh, or Paul McCartney. You can you can have eight million roses rather than four million. Uh, you, you can... You can just spend as much as you like, and as people spend more and more, the standards that define adequate 
did, did the family recognize what an important occasion this was? Uh, they, they inexorably tend to escalate. And, and that's not in your interest if you're a rich person. So if there's California has a progressive consumption tax and you live in New York, that's a reason to move to California. You, you don't want to spend more on a, a mansion or a, a wedding for your, for your kids. You, you want to take that money and spend it on your business or something that matters to you, not just I, idle escalation of the standards that define adequate. Yeah, I, I don't think that argument's working so well. Um, and I, I disagree with you about I, well, at least I'll leave it. I'm agnostic about whether people are leaving California because of their higher tax rates. They seem to be. Maybe they shouldn't be. Um, before we – and you can respond to that in a sec, but I don't want to miss this point. Before you uh, – we turn to the to the progressive consumption tax, which is next. I don't want to – we'll close on that. But, you know, Bob, I see you as a, as a preacher, and it's a side of – that preaching side is the same – I have the same side. I try to teach my kids not to overvalue fancy things like having the big, the biggest or the best or the fastest unless they give them explicit pleasure. Uh, so don't buy a fancy car to show off. Uh, it's not – It's that's a fool's game. Adam Smith wrote a whole book about it, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. I wrote a book about that book and that, that book is a preaching book. It's It's saying don't be over fool. Don't overvalue the things that are – uh, dross in this world, the things that are material and, ne- and not necessarily the ones that give life meaning, usually not the things that give life meaning. I think we're we're on that same page. The difference is I want I want to fight that fight at the private voluntary level, whether it's through religion, whether it's through the kind of preaching that I think you do. I don't want to force to have the government do that. And one of the reasons, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is I don't like what they do with the money. And so respond to that. Yeah, this gets back to our earlier exchange about building a responsive government. You know, if if you were really challenged to make a list of things that the government spends that you think they shouldn't be spending money on, uh, and then challenged uh, as a politician to get rid of those programs, you'd, you'd have a sense of what the problem is. You know, the Bush administration, when the deficits were growing in the early 2000s, realized they had to cut spending, what did they cut? They cut the Department of Energy's program for rounding up poorly guarded nuclear materials in the former Soviet Union. You know, these are materials that the terrorists were eager to get their hands on. They were guarded by uh, infrequently paid soldiers who drank too much. The facilities had low fences, easily breached. We should have been spending more money on that program, not less. Uh, but when you put pressure just to cut, what do you cut? You cut the things that people can't complain about. You know, these programs exist because of the arguments you, you make. There are constituencies for them. The, the concentrated interests can make their voices heard. Uh, it takes a very good government to resist that kind of pressure to spend money unwisely. And that's, that's the challenge we face is to build that kind of government. And, and we know from experience in other countries that it's possible to build a government like that. I know from watching our local government that it's possible to build a government like that. We have just an unbelievably responsive, responsible local government here where I live. And uh, it's not because it happened. It's because people stepped up. You know, they worked hard to build that. Well, I encourage our listeners to who are economists and political scientists to think about the institutional reasons that our government might not work as well as others and why some parts of our government work better than others, whether it's state and local versus federal or other differences. Uh, I think that's a really important research agenda, and I think we don't know much about it. So um, I, I don't disagree with with your main point, though. I think that's – it would be great if government were better. Uh, and I don't – I don't certainly don't have a desire to um, bash it for its own sake. Uh, so I, I'll accept that criticism if I'm guilty of it. Um Let's talk about a progressive consumption tax. I said I agree with it in the following. Let me say, why don't you lay out what it is, and I'll tell you what I like and what I don't like. Go ahead. Okay. It, it, administratively, it's very similar to the current income tax system. Uh, the difference is uh, you report how much you increased your savings during the year. That's the additional piece of information you report to the tax authorities. So they've got your annual income. They know how much you've increased your savings during the year. 
And the difference between those two numbers, your income minus your savings, that's your spending for the year. Uh, you don't have to keep track of your receipts or total everything up. You just uh, calculate your consumption as the difference between your income and your savings. And then there's a big standard deduction, let's say 30000 for a family of four. That gives you your ta taxable consumption, income minus savings minus 30000 and you pay tax on that. Rates start low. Uh, they escalate slowly, but then once you get up into one, two, three, four million dollars a year of spending, the rate on the next dollar can go as high as we choose without really causing any real negative effects. And that's again because most of the things people spend money on at that level are extremely positional in character. If you're spending, if the pleasure you take is that your car seems special, well, if it's the, if it's the best car out there, it's going to seem special whether the, the amount of resources that went into building it are a million dollars or $10 million. It's, it's a completely relative concept, special. Yeah, I, you know, I, I drive a Honda Accord. It, it, I, I view it as special without having to have it be as special as other people's special cars. Uh, I love that it has... Some of its features, which my car, even a trivial thing like keyless entry, uh, I find I, I still get pleasure from it too. Well, years it's ago. special <laughs> relative to the car you drove yeah, two years ago. Right. And so that part, that's where I'll agree with you. Uh, but the car you drove two years ago would have was knocked the socks off yeah. people in 1930. <laughs> Absolutely. And that there is a trade off between uh, innovation, doesn't always make us happy. You, you know, I, I agree with you on that. But I, I think it's an important human urge to make things better. And I, Oh, I, think, I, I agree. I think the momentary pleasures we get from those improvements count, even if they don't lead to great life satisfactions. And I'll, we would still get them. Yeah, maybe not as much. But um, let me talk about what I agree with. What I agree with is I, I'd love to have a consumption tax uh, instead of an income tax. I'd love to have a simple tax uh, rather than a complicated tax. Uh, I spend, unfortunately, a few days to do my income taxes, and I pay someone to do them on top of that. But just getting, getting things organized because the fact that I earn income in different states right. from where I speak, as is, is I'm sure you do too, it's just uh, – it's a very unpleasant thing. And if I did my own taxes, it would be ex extremely Even unpleasant. Even more unpleasant. Yeah, because I'd have to master a very, very complex set of rules. So I would, I would pay a lot more – I'd be happy to pay more in taxes for a simpler tax code, um, which is, an, I think, an area we agree on. And I wish it were based on consumption rather than income. And, you know, if it's going to – I prefer proportional tax for incentive reasons I've talked about before. I don't think it's healthy that people with low incomes pay nothing for tax or very, very, very little. I think it's fine. I don't mind paying more than other people, even, even maybe even more than proportionally. But it does set up some political incentives that maybe are not so healthy. I worry about that, and I think the effects of that are still remain to be seen. But that – how high that marginal tax rate should be, say, in the multi-million – dollar consumption area. We can disagree on that, but it, I, don't, I think that's much less important than the, uh, than the consumption part of it rather than the income part and the simplicity of it rather than the complexity part. So where do we disagree? Uh, I, don't, I don't view the uh, tax system as a useful way to uh, engineer our social relationships uh, about, say, my status relative to yours or uh, I, I want government to do what I think it should do well and let the private voluntary efforts be left over to do other things well. And so I don't – I would want a much smaller government. I don't need a 90 percent or a 60 percent uh, marginal tax rate and I don't need a 25 percent average tax rate or a 40 if we include state and local to do what I think government should do well and that includes defense uh, and, and, a, and a few other things. I think we could spend a fraction of what we're spending. And my preaching is is encouraging people to be open, opening their imagination to the possibility that that would be a better world. And you're going in a different direction. It's uh, in a way we're on the same page. I think the question is which produces more human flourishing. I think our current system, which gives too much money into the hands of centralized spending, reduces <laughs> human flourishing relative to what it would be if we relied on more voluntary efforts and allowed people more freedom to spend on what they want. You know, I think it's the very fact that we have freedom to spend on what we want that has pushed us into the corners that we find ourselves in much of the time. 
you know, the Adam Smith invisible hand presumption, at least on the part of the, the modern day uh, acolytes who, who, who offer it, is that if individuals spend their own money, they know best what pleases them. Uh, so you can rely on individuals. Maybe they'll make mistakes occasionally, but way better than government bureaucrats to decide how to spend their money. That's a, rhetorically a very powerful statement, but it's just at odds with what we know about how humans behave. Look, when individuals decide what's in their interest to do, sometimes we get great results from that, but there's no presumption that we'll get good results from that. Everybody stands up to see better at an event. Well, nobody sees any better than if everybody would remain comfortably seated. There's just no beginning presumption that if it's in your interest to do it, that it's in our interest that we all do it. And so if I can take a riskier job, uh, you, you might want to use uh, norms of prudence to, to govern workplace safety, but I don't think those are powerful enough to do the job we want done. If, if, if you allow me to take a riskier job for higher pay, I'm going to do that because, or at least I'll be tempted to do it because one of the payoffs I'll get from that is I'll be able to afford a house in a better school district. But then you'll want to do it too because that if I move up, that means you move down. And so you'll take a riskier job too. And if we all take riskier jobs, it's the metaphorical equivalent of all standing to, to see better in, in an arena. Nobody sees any better than before. All we succeed in doing is bidding up the prices of the houses in the better school districts. Still, half of all kids end up going to bottom half schools exactly the same as before. So I don't think private norms and preaching and, and its incentives can solve many of the most pressing problems that we face. You know, too much carbon in the air. Don't, don't, if you want to have a sleepless, sleepless night, read the latest reports on, on the melting of the polar ice caps. Uh, you know, the reason people put too much carbon in the air is that it's free to put it in the air. And you can have norms to discourage them. That, I'm in favor of that. But I think without a stiff carbon tax, we're not going to get where we need to get on that. I actually thought that the ice was growing at one of the poles. Do I have that wrong? Uh, the the overall level of the, the ice on the earth is receding very sharply. The sea le levels are rising way more rapidly than even the most oh, pessimistic forecasts sure from years ago. True. The last two years, so after there were very dire predictions three years ago about ice caps, and then the last two years, or at least two of the last three maybe, have been were surprisingly large in growth. And I was going to give you the last word there but until you said <laughs> that, but I... Uh, I just want to uh, – uh, that isn't where I want to end. I don't want to end on my uh, factual question about uh, the ice I would argue that those are – if indeed the world is warming in a disastrous way, that is a collective action problem that's going to be very difficult to solve through private action. There, there are private incentives that push us to reduce waste. And right now, I think we produced less carbon – Last year than the year before, for the first time in a long time, we put less carbon into the atmosphere, less carbon dioxide, which is kind of amazing. And I, that, even though as the, most of the world has gotten quite a bit richer, and I, and that of course is partly due to private incentives to save on energy usage, which yep. are always going to be there. But the real question again, I think, comes down to these questions of uh, the standing up um, problem, whether we're competing in an, essentially what is an arms race for. Um, private consumption and well-being and, and we disagree there so but i'll let you have the last word so go ahead you know i i think it shouldn't be a matter for us to argue about uh this thought experiment here's world a all the rich people have fifty thousand square foot mansions world b they all have hundred thousand square foot mansions where are people happier the rich people uh, i think that people in the 50,000 square foot mansions would be happier. Running a big mansion is a pain in the butt. And the only reason you need one that big is that people like you have them. And so you have to enter entertain in a certain manner and so on. If everybody had 50,000, that would be better. Do you disagree? Uh, I disagree a little bit. Uh, I, I just, I, not over whether 100,000 foot mansion, square foot mansions are better than 50,000. I think you're right. The, the marginal gain there might not be worth it and there is a competitive status aspect to it maybe i'm willing to concede that maybe on houses but um 
it's hard to decide when a house is too big. And I think, you know, I think where we fundamentally disagree and it's been I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think where we fundamentally disagree is what proportion of, of material life falls into that category versus categories where I can have where everybody can have more of something that gives them more pleasure. And it's not a, a pain in the butt. It's actually nice to have some of the things we spend our money on. They're not more problems to maintain. It doesn't mean that they're the same people get the same number. Actually, everybody gets more of them. There's more cell phones for everybody. It's not just like the rich people get the best ones and we stupidly compete to get the best one. Lots of people get the best one, not just the top right. one or five or 10 or even 25 percent. And it, they get better. And that's great. Okay. So we'll end on this. If we had a steeply progressive consumption tax, consumption would decline as a share of national income gradually. If we phased it in gradually, in investment would grow. The, the, the two sectors would move in the opposite direction in terms of share of GDP. Over time, greater investment would mean greater growth in productivity and growth in income so that in the new steady state, the absolute consumption path would be higher under a progressive consumption tax than under the current trajectory. So all the things you get pleasure from, you would get even more pleasure from if we had that tax. Well, that's why I like a consumption tax. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there, there you have it. My guest today has been Bob Frank. Bob, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, always a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.